Hello Year 8, it's Mrs Chiverton again and this is the final lesson in the Year 8 series of lessons about hormones and auxins. Before you start, as usual, please can you make sure you've switched off any notifications on the devices you're watching this video on so you're not interrupted in the lesson and please make sure you have got um, a pen and a piece of paper and all your exercise book ready for the lesson. Um, you will also need um, the seed germination experiment that you did last lesson with me if you were able to do that. Don't worry if you weren't, I've given you some results as part of this video. Remember, if the video is going too fast for you at any point in the activities, you can pause the video and complete the activity and then just restart the video when you are ready to move on. So today's lesson is part of the Hormones and Oxen series and this one is about the power of plants. So just as a starter and a think back to last lesson, what are the three factors that affect the germination of a seed? And I'm going to give you one minute to write down those three factors. OK, so hopefully you've listed those things from last lesson. So when we think about seeds germinating, they need oxygen, they need water and they need warmth to successfully germinate. Well done if you got all of those correct. So in today's lesson, what we're going to do is recall the equation for photosynthesis and we're going to be able to hopefully explain how limiting factors affect both photosynthesis and plant growth. So first of all, we're going to look at our results from our growth experiments before and our seed germination experiments. So if you have them, gather your Petri dishes together and what you need to do is to count up how many of them have germinated. And you will know they've been germinated because you'll be able to see a little shoot with um, some immature um, leaves attached to them and maybe even a root forming, similar to what I've shown you on the picture here. And what I want you to do is simply count up how many of the 10 seeds that you put on have successfully germinated. If they have all germinated, then what you might want to do is measure how big the seedlings are with a ruler in order to make a judgment about which ones have germinated the most successfully. If you're going to do that now, pause the video and make your um, judgments and then you can restart the video ready to move on. For those of you who weren't able to carry out the experiment, that's absolutely fine. And I've put some photographs here of some um, results from a similar experiment that was carried out in school. So for those that were kept in the cold, out of the 10 seeds, none of them were able to germinate. They all still look like the original seeds. Of the ones that were kept at room temperature, uh, and this might be quite chilly in a classroom, um, but we found that four of them had successfully germinated. And of those that were kept in the warmth, um, there were 10 seeds out of the 10 that had all germinated. And hopefully you can see quite clearly here, these ones have started to develop roots there and hopefully we would see some shoots quite quickly afterwards. So we're going to use those results to draw some conclusions from our investigation. So to write a conclusion, what you must do is say how many seeds germinated at each temperature. I include a pattern stating if temperature affects the germination of the seeds. And if you can, a scientific explanation for your pattern. Now, this could be something quite simple, 
but you could do some more research if you wanted to include some more um, complex scientific explanations. So I'm going to give you all two minutes to complete your conclusion, either from the results I gave you or from your own experiment. Off you go. If you need a little bit more time, just pause this video, but if not, we're going to go through what I hope you will have found in your conclusions. So, from the given class results, we can see that at the coldest temperature, zero crest seeds germinated. At the middle temperature, it was 40% of the crest seeds germinated. And at the warmest temperature, 100% of the crest seeds germinated. So we can conclude from our experiment that the warmer the temperature, the greater the germination of crest seeds. And this happens because the higher temperatures encourage the chemical reactions needed for germination. Now, I do need to note here that if we had gone to much higher temperatures, then actually we would have seen a reverse of this, because when the temperatures get too high, it stops the chemical reactions from happening because they're controlled by enzymes which get damaged at very high temperatures. But for the results that we had, that's the conclusions that we can draw. So what's a seedling? And as you can see from my um, picture here, a seedling is a very immature plant. So after the seeds have germinated, they've started to develop simple roots and they have got their first set of leaves and that we would class as a seedling. Once germinated, plants will quickly use up the nutrients that are stored in the original seed. But then they will have grown their roots and shoots with leaves and at that point, they will be able to start to produce their own food through a process of photosynthesis. And there is a little clue as to one of the things that's needed for photosynthesis there in the animation. So you have heard this before, but what I want you to try and do is recall from year seven what the word equation was for photosynthesis. So that's the names of the chemicals and anything else that's involved in it. And then as an extension, please have a go at writing the chemical symbol equation for photosynthesis. So this will be involving the chemical formula like CO2 and H2O. OK, you've got two minutes to get that information down. Remember, we have an arrow in the middle of our equation, not an equal sign. And anything that's not a chemical goes top and bottom above that arrow.
That's your two minutes up. So in terms of our word equation, a plant takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that it absorbs through its leaves. It takes water from the soil, which it absorbs through its roots. And in the leaves of the plant, chlorophyll traps light energy. And all of that goes together to make a sugar called glucose, which the plants can use for respiration and lots of other things like building new materials and to produce oxygen. If we look at the symbol equation, CO2 plus H2O makes C6H12O6 plus O2. But of course, we need to balance that. So actually, we need six of everything apart from the glucose. So if you can remember these now, that's going to be really, really useful moving forward because you absolutely need to know these for your GCSEs as well. So well done to those of you who got them. And if you haven't, you might want to write them down and then learn them because it's a really useful step forward. So photosynthesis is a chemical reaction that actually happens in plants. And the rates of chemical reactions can be changed depending on the availability of the reactants and any energy needed for the reaction to happen. And if you don't have enough of something, then this can be called a limiting factor. So, so let's investigate some of those factors. And our first one, how do you think um, the amount of water might affect plant growth? So let's look at some results of an experiment. And what we can see here is a very clear difference in these two plants. Now, these identical plants were grown in the same type of soil and received the same temperature, the same amount of light and the same amount of carbon dioxide. The only thing that was different about them was the amount of water that they received. So that means that the amount of water available is clearly affecting the growth of the plant. And that's because water is needed for photosynthesis. So we can class water as a limiting factor. So water clearly did affect the plant growth. Without water, the plants didn't even germinate. So that's one clear factor. So what else might affect plant growth as well? And you can see a clue in the picture here. So let's look at some other experiments. The seedlings in the pot in the middle have been grown in the dark. The seedlings on the left hand side have been grown with a light above them and the ones on the right hand side have also been grown in daylight but with a light from one side. So what do we notice is different? Well there are two effects that this experiment actually shows and we're going to look at them separately but they are connected. So the seedlings in the pot in the middle that were grown in the dark, if you looked at them, the seedlings were very tall, but they were also very yellow and not very healthy looking. And this is a similar experiment where we have got here um, identical seedlings. So they're the same type of seed. They uh, have been kept at the same temperature with the same levels of carbon dioxide and given the same amount of water. But again, we can see that those without the light have actually grown much taller initially don't look very healthy. And the ones that have been grown in daylight have um, a much healthier, much greener. So again, we can clearly see here, because we've controlled all of the other variables, that light is definitely something that is affecting the growth of plants. Now, if we go back to our original experiment and we look at the pot on the right, and that one has been grown with light off to one side, off to the right. And if we notice that, the seedlings seem to be growing towards the light. Now, this is a GCSE keyword alert, and you'll do more about this when you do your GCSEs. But this movement of a plant towards the light is called phototropism. OK, and with that word photo would mean anything to do with light, like a photograph. So photo is to do with like photosynthesis, using light to make things. And these experiments, the results of these experiments show that light indeed is a limiting factor. It affects the rate of photosynthesis. Now that phototropism experiment is part of a very famous um, set of experiments that have been done. Scientists have carried out lots and lots of different experiments to see the effects of light on the growth of plants. And this is the results of a very famous experiment, as I've said. 
And what it did was it proved that the growth of seedlings is controlled by chemicals called auxins. And these are produced in the growing tips of the plants. And they cause the plant tips to grow towards the light. Now these auxins are plant hormones. So in experiment one, you can see there that with the light off to one side, the shoots actually seem to bend towards the direction of the light. They actually grow in that direction. In experiment two, what they did was they covered the tips of the plants with opaque foil. So it stopped the light getting through. Even though the light was still there, it couldn't reach the cells in the tips of the shoots. And in this case, although the plants kept on growing, they didn't bend over. In experiment three, they wanted to check that it wasn't just the presence of the foil, it was where the foil was, in other words, where the light was able to get. So they put little foil collars further down the shoots and the light was able to get to the tips. And again, we had this bending effect. So this is an example of phototropism. And the plants that grow in the dark are also trying to grow towards light, but they keep on growing because they don't actually reach any light if they are in the dark. So other than water and sunlight, what is the final limiting factor of photosynthesis? And there's a little bit of a clue here in the photograph. So if we compare, these are the same type of seeds grown in very cold conditions and grown in much warmer conditions. And we can see that they're very different. These ones have grown much taller. Their leaves are much more robust as well. These ones are quite shriveled and they really haven't grown very much at all. So in your exercise book, please record the three factors that can limit photosynthesis. And then for each one of them, could you say why it's important that we understand these limiting factors? And there's a challenge for you. If we do understand these limiting factors, what might we be able to do? So I'm going to give you three minutes because there are three questions for you to answer.
OK, so you can mark these yourself and make any amendments that you need to. So the three factors that we've said can limit photosynthesis are water, sunlight and temperature. When you move into GCSE, we'll also talk about the carbon dioxide levels as well. And why is it important that we understand these limiting factors? Well, if we can control these factors, we can increase photosynthesis and that means that plants will grow more. And that's really important because we need more food to feed a growing population. The population on our planet is growing very, very quickly. And also the plants will take in more carb carbon dioxide as they photosynthesize and grow. And that, of course, can help to reduce global warming. So well done if you got any of those correct. I'm hoping you got most of them in there. I'm going to move on as soon as you've got those done. So we're just going to extend our, our thoughts. And um, as I alluded to earlier on, some plants um, can actually survive in very hot conditions or indeed in very cold conditions. So can you think of a plant that can survive in very hot conditions? And how is this actually possible? And I'm going to give you a minute just to have a think about what kind of plant it is. There is a bit of a clue in the picture and um and why that you know why it might be able to do that because many plants would die if they were in conditions that were too hot Okay, so hopefully you thought of a cactus. All right, so a cactus is a plant that has very special adaptations that allows it to enable it to survive in extreme conditions. And the diagram there shows some of those adaptations. So plants have, uh, these type of plants have very thick waxy skins and very large fleshy stems. And instead of leaves, they have very tiny spikes and then if we were able to look underground, we would see that there would be very shallow, widespread roots. So the roots don't go a long way into the ground, but they are spread over a very, very large area, well beyond the area in which the plant is actually fixed. So thinking about those four factors, how do these give the plants a survival advantage? What is so special about them that allows them to survive in these extremely hot conditions? So one of the ways that you could record this is as a table. So you could make the adaptations on one side and then state what the advantage is, how it helps them to survive on the other side. So I'm going to give you five minutes, one minute to produce your table and then another four minutes to fill in those answers. So for each adaptation, what is it that allows it to survive in those extremely hot conditions?
Okay, let's have a look at some answers for this one. So the thick waxy stone, okay, that would um, stop water loss by evaporation. Remember, water is one of the limiting factors for photosynthesis. So without that water, the plant wouldn't be able to photosynthesize. The large fleshy stem is another area where it can actually store water for photosynthesis. So um, where these cacti live, there's often only one rainy season in the year and the rest of the time it's very, very dry. So they will absorb the water that they can in the rainy season and store it in their big fleshy stem until it rains again. The spikes have got two functions. They're actually modified leaves. And um, first of all, that reduces water loss. So again, that water can be used for photosynthesis, but it also protects them from being eaten by animals as well, because nobody wants to eat something nasty and spiky. And then finally, those shallow widespread leaves. What they will do is they will collect any available rain from a very large area so that again, it can be stored for photosynthesis um, in the dry seasons. So hopefully you've got some of those answers uh, recorded in your table. If not, pause the video and record down any of the other information that you need. So it's the end of our lesson on um, plant hormones and plant growth. And um, you may have been given a Google quiz, in which case, please complete that now. And then in addition to that, there are some key learning points. So just in case you didn't get any of this information down, so once germinated, plants will quickly use up the nutrients stored in the seed. And once they've grown roots and shoots with leaves, they'll start to produce their own food through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a chemical reaction that happens in plants. And the rate of chemical reaction can be changed depending on the availability of the reactant and any energy needed for the reaction to happen. And if you don't have enough of something like this, it's called a limiting factor. The limiting factors for photosynthesis are water, sunlight and temperature and controlling them can increase photosynthesis and therefore um, plant growth. And this will help to feed growing populations and reduce global warming as photosynthesis takes in that carbon dioxide. So make sure you've added any of those notes to your, um, your notes in your book or on your paper if there's anything that you have missed. And I will see you again in another Year 8 lesson.